Are you cruising through life not always knowing what direction you were headed? Let Live On Purpose with Dr. Paul Jenkins be your guide. Live On Purpose will give you insights into your life and show you how you can become the driver and captain of it. No more aimless wandering. By learning the principles that govern happiness and wealth, you will be able to make personal progress that you have only dreamed possible. And now, here's your host, the shrink who expands your life, Dr. Paul. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Live on Purpose Radio. This is Dr. Paul, the shrink who expands your life, bringing you another episode of Live on Purpose Radio. I am excited to talk about a number of principles today with a fascinating guest. I was I was introduced to this man uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, as he was uh, giving a keynote address in Salt Lake City. He is one of the world's most respected authorities on forgery, embezzlement, secured documents, identity theft. These are some of the things that he does professionally. But you might best recognize our guest today from a story that was told. Now, when when someone's life story attracts the attention of the likes of Steven Spielberg, uh, you know it's got to be quite a story. And there's a movie that came out in 2002 called Catch Me If You Can, which was directed by Mr. Spielberg and starred Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. And in this movie, a young man in his teens ran away from home and then successfully, I'll use that word uh, loosely, we'll get to that in just a minute, but successfully posed as an airline pilot, a pediatrician, an attorney, there's a number of different things. And uh, so that's why the story was so fascinating. This man's name is Frank Abagnale, and I am so pleased to have you, Mr. Abagnale, on our show with us today. My pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me, Dr. Paul. Thanks for joining us at Live on Purpose Radio. The, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of our listeners right now are wondering, okay, what's, what's up here? Dr. Paul usually has these inspiring principle-based stories. And most of you, if not all of you, if, if you haven't yet, please go get the last episode of Live on Purpose Radio where I posted uh, this story as told by Frank Abagnale. And uh, Frank, you, when, when you talked in Salt Lake City a few weeks ago, you said, you know, this story has been told in books and uh, Steven Spielberg made this movie about it. It's all their point of view and you wanted to tell it from your point of view. Correct. Uh, yes. And uh, I think it's very important when I publicly go out and speak to tell people, you know, the real story as it is and what actually happened and what it meant to my life and where mm -hmm. it brought me in my life. Right. And, you know, I'm going to defer or, or at least refer our, uh, our listeners to that latest episode of Live on Purpose Radio where they can hear that story from your perspective. That's been posted on our website. And thank you so much for your permission in, in allowing us to post that. Happy to do that. But you know, the most inspiring part of that story to me comes after the bulk of what the movie focuses on. There was a transition at one point, and, and I remember you saying in that speech that uh, you could say that prison had reformed you or that you know some of these other experiences in your life finally woke you up to a sense of what you needed to do. But you brought it back to, uh, to family, to the love that you experienced in your marriage and in raising your sons, um, that this was the transforming experience in your life. And since that time, you've committed yourself to service. Uh, you've become an expert in some of the things that I mentioned earlier in assisting law enforcement agencies, including the, the FBI, with, with combating the types of crimes that were committed earlier in your life. Uh, you've maintained a successful and happy marriage, and you've raised three successful sons. So That's that, correct, and that, that to me is basically the most important part of my life. I know that people are fascinated by what I did 40 years ago as a teenager, mm -hmm. but I look at my life as not that those were the amazing things. The amazing things is that I did those things, and yet I was able to turn my life around because I live in such a great country. 
mm-hmm. be able to get married, raise three sons, and live a great productive life and be able to contribute back to that country that gave me that opportunity to do so. So I think that's the most amazing part of my life is what I've done with it after what occurred in the movie. That's right. And to me, that is the inspiring part of this story. I think what happened 40 years ago, you know, that gives you a tool now to catch people's attention. Exactly. What you do with that tool now is the really important thing. And, you know, that would segue really nicely into a discussion that I was hoping to have with you. And that has to do with principle and ethics and what it is that that really drives what we do. You know, I believe that people make their decisions based on a level of moral reasoning and sometimes desperation or a feeling of competitiveness or something else that's that's pushing them along in their life causes them to try to take shortcuts or to try to create some kind of supposed success uh, through unprincipled means. And uh, I've heard you speak about this a little bit, but I, I want to just kind of throw that ball your direction and see what you do with it. You know, I've been working with the FBI now for 34 years. I've been teaching FBI agents at the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia. I've seen crime, needless to say, change tremendously. What I did 40 years ago as a teenager, unfortunately, is 4,000 times easier to do today because of technology. It has made it very simple to do. And what I've learned over all these years on both sides of the law is that what it really comes down to is very simple ethics and character. We live in a society where we do not teach ethics at home. We live in a society where we do not teach ethics in school because the teacher would be accused of teaching morality. We live in a society where we can't even find a four-year college course on ethics. I've had three sons go to college and graduate. Uh, The only one that went to law school had a course offered to him on ethics. And consequently, today, we're living in a society where there is very little character and there is very little ethics And consequently, people think nothing of lying and cheating. This entire financial meltdown is not really an indictment of the free enterprise system, but of raw capitalism unrestrained by sound business ethics. Principles of ethics that have guided American businesses for decades were basically set aside. I blame Mm -hmm. epic collapses by government, bankers, and consumers. At the government level, power-seeking politicians eager to earn favor and votes from their constituents established irrational programs allowing low-income people to buy houses they could not afford, Mm -hmm. guaranteeing that many of them would default. Bankers Mm -hmm. motivated by greed and loan money to underqualified people collected their fees and sold the risky paper to someone else. Mm -hmm. Some fraudulently inflated their figures to even get more money. And consumers... Blinded by materialism and a culture of instant gratification, bought houses beyond their means, gambling that the market would go up and they would be able to sell at a profit. But when the market went down, they were left with an upside down on mortgages they could not afford. And basically, this is a great point that I've been trying to make for years about where we are going with character and ethics in our, in our society. You know, we can mm-hmm. build the most sophisticated system in the world whether it be hardware or software, but if one person in that chain of that system is unethical or lacks some character, the system is doomed to fail. And that's where we are today. Every system we have in place is, is being, we have people in those systems that have a lack of character and a lack, a lack of uh, ethics. Last week, I spoke at Duke University to 50 United States federal district judges. And when my talk was over, they got to ask me an hour worth of questions, which came from everything about life in prison to rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. But when we got to the subject of ethics, I explained to them that we are living today in a society where there are no ethics and no character, and consequently, this is why we are seeing all this crime. I mean, white-collar crime in America Mm -hmm. is $660 billion a year, 6% of the gross national product. We don't read about that. But we worry about the $700 billion bailout, the $200 billion for Katrina, the $150 billion for the war effort in Iraq. We think nothing of the $660 billion that goes out the door in unpaid taxes, loss of revenue, and ultimately mm-hmm. the American consumer who has to pick up that tab. So, you know, one of the judges asked me, well, you and I are about the same age. I'm 60. This a judge said, you and I are about the same age. What's the difference between when you and I grew up and uh, now? And I said, mm-hmm. well, for example, Your Honor, I said, when 
I was a kid. My favorite show was The Rifleman on TV with Chuck Connors. I said, but in The Rifleman, though it was maybe 25 minutes of film, and you had all the shoot-ups and the Western stuff, there was always a message to his son about character, right and wrong, ethics. You watch TV and you walked away with some kind of positive message. Mm -hmm. Today, I cannot think of one television show on TV that is not a negative message that says it's okay to cheat on your wife. It's okay to sleep with someone you're not married to. It's okay to break the law. But consequently, young people are just bombarded with this. So when they get out into the workplace, they think it's okay to steal. It's okay to lie. It's okay to deceive. And that's where we are as a society today. Mm. You know, it, it's fascinating to me. You you are considered one of the leading experts in the world on document security and trying to build these systems that you're talking about. But what I'm hearing from you is at the end of the day, the systems don't matter because it's people who enact and, and embody those systems. And without character and integrity and a commitment to principles and ethics, any system is going to break down. Absolutely. And, and just going, you know, I travel every day. I travel about four days a week. I have to go through airport security all over the world every day of my life almost and be searched. And it bothers me because every time I go through the security, I know in my mind that I could beat that system because mm -hmm. I know there's a weak link there. There's that person behind that screen that's looking at what's in my bag. And if I can get to that person behind that screen, then mm -hmm. I can go through there with whatever I want to go through there with. So to me, that really concerns me that there are these, these weak links. And I would much rather live in a society where I would be very difficult for me to get to that person behind that screen because they would have some character and some ethics and they would not do something that would endanger their country. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, I can't say that today because people are really lacking those two tools that I think are very, very necessary in one's life. Mm. This And the, I, I think I heard you mention also that we're really not teaching this in our homes the way that we could. And we're not teaching it in our homes. You know, um, my parents raised me in a Catholic school. I was raised by loving parents, and I was raised by parents who believed in God, and they taught my, my brother and sister and I that right from wrong. Like a lot mm -hmm. of people in life, I went down a road, and I got on the wrong path, and I made some very bad mistakes. But I had the rope my parents had given me mm -hmm. to grab that rope and pull me back to the right trail because those things were instilled in me at a very young age. I am very concerned about children today that do not have that rope. When they go down that wrong path, there is nothing to put them back on the right path. They don't know what the right path is, and that concerns me a great deal. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to a discussion about that rope specifically a little later in our discussion. Stick with us. We'll be right back. This is Kirk Weasler to tell you about morebetterbooks.com. Morebetterbooks.com is where you can find more better books for a more better life. Not only that, let me tell you about some of the very fun and cool select titles on morebetterbooks.com. You want to get a copy of The Dog Poop Initiative. This best smelling book could change your life forever. It certainly changed the lives of thousands of Boeing employees as well as school teachers, parents, leaders across the United States and in Israel and in Germany. And you can get your own copy at morebetterbooks.com. Whoa, that's not all. What about The Cookie Thief? This classic tale told in a rhyming format fully illustrated with very fun hit messages. Pick up a copy now today on morebetterbooks.com. Other great titles there, Finding Your Pathway to Mastery, Beyond Illusions, Make It Great, these titles are only available on morebetterbooks.com. Go to morebetterbooks.com today and begin to have a more better life and live that life on purpose. If the pile of books you want to read is growing faster than the pile you have read, then Abundant Reading Systems can help you. After taking Abundant Reading Systems course, I dramatically increased my ability to expand my knowledge in a much more efficient way. My fastest test today was in 7,000 words per minute. I highly recommend this program. From what I've seen it do for other people who've been through the entire program and from what I've seen in myself today. I've teamed up with Abundant Reading Systems to offer a single day intensive speed reading workshop that will at least double your reading speed, guaranteed. 
this belief started to grow inside of me that I thought, oh, I can really do this. I can read, you know, as fast as I let myself read. And uh, ended up doubling my time, my speed reading time, which was really good. This is David Hinton, founder of Abundant Reading Systems. I want to personally invite you to join us for our next event. Visit AbundantReadingSystems.com now. Abundant Reading Systems, reading at the speed of imagination. Welcome back, everybody. Frank, I was thinking as we were in our break, you know, you, you just kind of passed this off very nonchalantly that you said, you know, you go through airport security and you're thinking, wow, I could beat that system. And most of us have watched a movie that depicts you beating a number of systems. And uh, I know that's Hollywood's version of of what happened. But it occurred to me that at the at the end of the day, it's the character and integrity and the commitment to principles and ethics that allows us to even live a, a life of reasonable safety and predictability. You drive down the freeway, and you're counting on people to follow some basic rules. And their commitment to to do that is what allows you to even be safe out there, reasonably safe. That's exactly, you hit it right on the head, that's exact. We can make all of the laws in the world. We can make the most sophisticated software and hardware, but we're always going to be relying on the character and the ethics of that person to do the right thing to make that work. So it's just like TSA. I'm relying on the character and the ethics of, I don't care about the person who checks my license. I don't care about the person who's standing there giving me directions. I'm worried about the person looking at the screen. That's the only flaw. And I'm worried Mm -hmm. that that person is going to have character and ethics and is going to do the right thing. But if they decide not to or they're bribed by money, uh, then we have a serious problem. And uh, that's mm-hmm. why all systems have a flaw. Usually when a company says to me, we have a foolproof system, I tell them that's impossible. There is no foolproof system. And if you believe you have a foolproof system, you have failed to take into consideration the creativity of fools. So it is always going to come back to the individual who is controlling, manipulating, or operating that system. Mm. You know, you've been, you mentioned this in your in your speech in Salt Lake, you've been accused of being a genius. What's your response to that? I, I'm not a genius. You know, I get a lot of young people that write me and say, you know, you were a genius. I was just a teenage boy. I was just 16 years old who, who ran away from a broken home. Uh, Mm -hmm. If I was anything, I was somewhat of an opportunist. I was someone who was creative. I was someone somewhat of an entrepreneur. I saw things that other people didn't see and saw the flaw in them or the way to get around them. But by no means was I a genius. If I was a genius, I don't really think that I would have found it necessary to simply break the law in order to survive. People survive Mm -hmm. every day without breaking the law. So... I would never want to say that I was a genius because I just looked upon that uh, someone who was a little bit creative in a time when people were a little more trusting and I was able to get away with some of the things I got away with. I was smart enough Mm -hmm. to know I'd never get away with it forever, but I thought that I'd be able to get away with it for a little while. So the real genius has been developing in the 40 years since all of that happened as you've started to learn the importance of ethics and principles. As you know, when the government took me out of prison, I was 26 years old. And to be very honest with you, when they came to me and said, we'd like to remove you from prison to work for an agency of the government, I just saw it as a way of getting out of prison. I didn't think of it anything more than that. But then when I went to work Mm -hmm. with the FBI, I got to work with some of the finest young men and women who uh, are so dedicated to their country and their job, Uh, men and women who are family people, who love their family, love their children, love their country, that it kind of just wears on you, that you can't help but get caught up in that and the patriotism and the the respect people have for uh, protecting citizens and 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 making the law be the law and making the law effective. And so as time went by, I decided to stay. I've been at the FBI 26 years beyond what legal requirement I had to be there. 
And mm-hmm. that's why I stayed there, because I can't ask to be around and surrounded by more ethical uh, people than the pe- men and women who work in the FBI. And it's a great honor to, to work with them every day and to help teach them and to help support them in the field and so on. So mm-hmm. it's a great honor for me to do this every day. You know, I was thinking as you were sharing that, that uh, over the course of my career, I've engaged in a number of different practices. One of one of the things that I'm going to come back to in a few minutes, because this is a unique area that you can address, is that I've done child custody evaluations for the court for about 15 years. Another thing that I've done is screenings for law enforcement agencies. So these new officers that are being hired will come through and they'll get a little psychological workup and I'll provide a report back to the agency. But, you know, one of the most difficult things about that, the profile, the psychological profile of a criminal and of a police officer are not that different. That's true. And and that's a little uh, disheartening maybe to some folks, but but really it's exactly what you are talking about here. You've got... as a youth, you had the creativity, you had the initiative, you had that entrepreneurial spirit, you had that uh, I'm not going to perish attitude, but you were applying it in ways that were very different than the way that you've applied them over the course of most of your adult life. And I see that same thing as I'm screening police officers, for example, or evaluating people who have been referred by the court. The profile may be very similar, but their choice in how to apply some of the unique characteristics of their own personality is very different. It's and that's the... knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's just like when mm-hmm. people used to say, tell me about con men. I said, you know, there are a lot of con men. There are politicians. There are car salesmen. There are great real estate brokers, a great salespeople. They're mm-hmm. basically the same thing. They know how to talk. They know how to manipulate people. They know how to get convinced people to the way of their way of thinking a good preacher, a good reverend. The difference is they walk the line of knowing the right, the difference between right and wrong. So the only difference between a great con man and a great car salesman is a car salesman knows not to cross that line between ethics and character and good ethic, business ethics and sound principles, whereas the criminal is willing to cross the line and uh, break ethics and uh, have no character and, and doesn't really care what happens to mm-hmm. the victim. And that's really the only difference. So a good policeman, a good criminal, they're both creative. They're very smart. They're streetwise. The only difference is the policeman knows that fine line and knows to stay on the right side of the line and to, and to keep the laws in effect because they know how important it is to do so versus the criminal who doesn't have that quality in them. Well, you've had some associations with, with people on both sides of that decision. And I've worked a little bit in some some institutions where people are incarcerated, and and I'm, I'm recalling specifically an experience I had with a bunch of youth in a facility where I was working in Oregon. And uh, these kids were all in there because of gang crimes. Some of them who had committed murders or or thefts or other um, serious crimes. And I did a little experiment with the group one day just to see if they know the difference between right and wrong. <laughs> And I just threw out a few, you know, here's the scenario. Is that right or wrong? And everybody knew that right. it was right or wrong. I think that there's an innate sense in, in people, but what happens to them? What's your experience? Do they do they numb that out or choose to ignore it or just kind of give in to some of the pressures of life? What's your well, opinion? Well, I think a lot of people also are looking for the easy way. You know, they're looking for the easy way out. There's a way to get from from A to B, and some people... Uh, do it by going and just they want to get there immediately instead of getting there the proper way. You know, and I think uh, that's the difference. And once you get caught up doing these kind of things, it does become a way of life. I think one of the most depressing things to me, and, you know, I served time in the French prisons. I served time in the Swedish prisons. I served time in the American federal prison Mm -hmm. system. And when I was in the federal prison system for four years in Virginia, One of the most depressing things to me was that every person I met, and these were younger people, uh, probably all of the inmates there were under 30, Mm -hmm. all of the inmates that were there, every one of them was thinking about their next scam. I never once met one of them who sat down and said, you know, when I get out of here, I really need to do something with my life. I need to get my life in order. They were all thinking about, what's the next thing I can do? Can you teach me how to forge checks? Can you do that? They all had this very negative uh, outlook on, on life, and so... 
uh, you, you go to prison, and unfortunately prison is a place where you become very institutionalized, where someone tells you when to get up and when to go to bed and presses your clothes and feeds you. And uh, if you need a dentist, you go to the dentist. If you need a doctor, you go to the doctor. And after a while, it becomes a place where it's not really that bad a way of life to them. And the only mm-hmm. thing you miss is your freedom. And then one day, someday, someone tells you to leave. And they open the door and they send you out, and you realize you have to pay rent. You have to go get a job. You have to pay taxes. And you start to say to yourself, well, you know, that place wasn't so bad. And you think about going back, you know, if if I do something, the worst can happen is I'll go back there. Mm -hmm. Whereas the French prisons were extremely bad. Nobody physically came in and abused you, but it was a very bad environment. And they were basically saying, don't, you don't want to come back here. And you didn't. So when I go to Mm -hmm. France now, I don't jaywalk. I don't double park. I don't do any of that. (laughs) So it had a much more of an impression on me than the American prison system. The truth is there's people in the American prison system living better than people on the street who never dreamed of breaking the law. And that's not a good thing. Uh, Yeah, well, that's one of the problems that I think we really need to address in our society if we're going to be successful. There's, you know, as you're talking about the easy way, it's so psychologically, it's just very easy to be addicted to easy. And to just look at that as the way, that's the ticket. If I could just do that, that, that would be so easy. But I believe there's also a, there's an easy hard versus hard easy kind of a dynamic going on. And if you choose to do the easy thing now, you're likely to have a harder life. And I agree. And I think, but this is a thing that I believe that really needs to be taught. I really think that it needs to be taught not only in the home, but it, it needs to be taught in school. When I speak to school teachers, they tell me, well, you know, that's no, we're not really allowed to talk about that. And I say, well, what can you talk about? Well, sometimes I'll say to a student, you're in the mall and you find a wallet on the floor. What do you do? And the student will raise their hand and say, well, I pick up the wallet. Okay, now in the wallet's a $100 bill and some credit cards. What do you do next? Well, I'm going to take the $100 bill, put it in my pocket, I'm going to throw the wallet away. I'm not allowed to, at that point, as a teacher, say to them, well, that would be the wrong thing to do. That would be stealing. What you would need to do is it because I would be teaching morality, and the school system Uh. doesn't allow me to teach morality. And I think that's just ridiculous. I think we should always be teaching morality, character, and ethics in school. When you go off to college and the university, there should be a program to be teaching character and ethics in that program, right and wrong. And when you go to work for your employer, you should be able to have a code of conduct or that the employer says, this is what we believe, this is what we practice, this is our principles and our ethics, and we want you to understand this is what they are. And if you work for us, we expect you to follow those principles and ethics. I mean, if you work for a company that deceives, cheats, and lies to their customers, then all you're breeding is a group of cheaters, liars, and deceivers. And But if you work for a company that has character and ethics and instills it in their employees, it goes a long way to keeping that company a very honest company and the people that work there very honest. But this is a matter of teaching. We have to get back to teaching this. It's not just going to happen. Mm-hmm. It has to be taught. And how will they know otherwise? Exactly. That's right. We'll be right back. This is Shay Larson, IdeaOrbit.com, with the World of Ideas Report. Do you remember watching the futuristic cartoon The Jetsons? Did you ever think it would be possible to put a jetpack on your back and fly around like a superhero? Well, hold on to your purse. Because as of last month, it is now not only possible, there is a new product on the market that you can purchase that will send you soaring like Superman. Glenn Martin's dream of making personal flight a reality is now just that. The Martin Jetpack currently sells for a cool $100,000 and is available online. After purchase, you are required to meet certain agreements and regulations Then, you will be professionally trained for personal flight. The Martin Jetpack can go 63 miles per hour, can take you 8,000 feet off the ground, and can travel 31 miles before it requires refueling. Analysts are saying within 10 to 15 years, 
it is very possible that we will be personally flying to work and the grocery store. To Glenn Martin, we offer our impressed congratulations for his uplifting idea. This is Shay Larson, IdeaOrbit.com, with the World of Ideas Report. I've got a great idea. Wouldn't you like to know? You probably can't bear it, so I guess I'll have to share it. I thought of it a moment. Thank you for listening to Live On Purpose Radio. Some of you have been asking how you can get more involved with the show. And I also appreciate those of you who have offered to support the show. Now you can do both easily by purchasing a Top Spots listing. For a very small donation to the show, your link will be posted at liveonpurposeradio.com. Just go to the website and look for the Top Spots widget on the right side panel. Click at the bottom and follow the simple instructions. You will then be at the top of the list. Thanks for your support. And when you dream, dream big, as big as the ocean. When you dream, it might come true. When you dream, well, welcome back, everybody. We've got Mr. Frank Abagnale on the show with us today. Frank, it's been fascinating just thinking through some of some of what we've been discussing here and, and what we left off with in our last segment about teaching, teaching principles and morals and values, which at the end of the day are the only thing that we have in terms of security. Absolutely. Well, it's, uh, it, I'm going to come back to something else you mentioned earlier. You said that you had a rope that your parents had given you that you came back to later in life after you went off and you did all kinds of crazy things. Uh, but there was deep inside of you somewhere instilled a sense of these values and morals and ethics that your good parents had taught you. Uh, talk about that just a little bit and what role that played. In well, you know, I know that around. when I first ran away from home, I was 16 years old when I started doing these things. And, you know, being an adolescent, I, I didn't have a lot of fear of being caught because I really didn't sit there and think about all the consequences. And I would try to justify everything in my mind. So I would say to myself, okay, I'm going to walk in this bank in New York City and I'm going to write a check for $500. And if they cash the check, I'll have $500 in my pocket. But this bank's not going to really care. They have billions of dollars. So $500 mm -hmm. isn't going to hurt them. And that was my line of thinking. What was funny, though, is if I was at that same age and walked into, say, a dry cleaner in New York, and the people were in the back working, and the register was open, and there was cash in the drawer, I wouldn't have taken the cash out of the drawer, because I thought to myself, that was wrong, that was stealing. Mm -hmm. And I would have never said to myself, I'll take this money. But they were basically the same thing. But what I noticed as I got a little older, 18 and 19, and was still on the run from the authorities, I would walk into a bank to cash a check, but I would convince the teller to cash it. She wasn't supposed to cash it, but I would convince her that it was okay to cash it, and she'd cash it, and I'd walk outside and say to myself, you know, I really hope this teller doesn't lose her job, you know, because I really talked her into cashing. If this teller loses oh. her job, then she's not maybe not going to be able to get another job in the bank. And that really bothered me, and there were many times I walked around and went back in and said, you know, I made a mistake. Uh, that's, I really didn't want to cash that check. Let me just get that check back. And so I realized as I was getting older, all the things I had been taught were starting to come back, and I was starting to get that conscience, and I was starting to realize that by getting a little older that there is right and there is wrong, and that when you do things which you may think harm nobody, hurt a lot of people, uh, all those things came back because they were taught to me earlier, and they started to come back as I got a little older. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, you have to instill those things in a child. And as they grow up, they have those tools. And like I said, everyone makes mistakes, and everyone goes down the wrong road sometimes. But you at least have the right tools instilled in you to go back on the right, on the right road. I have a lot of parents who consult with me or come to me for consultation or, or coaching. and Occasionally, they are just distraught because their child is making some decisions that they personally find very 
uh, very difficult to accept. You know, maybe they're doing some some law breaking or they're violating principles in other ways. And these parents sometimes feel like they've been a failure. And while we're on this particular part of our discussion, I guess I could ask you straight up, who's responsible for your behavior? <laughs> You know, I don't want, I don't, I would never in my life want to use my parents' divorce for a crutch. Right. But there's no question that my parents' divorce was the reason I ran away from home. And mm-hmm. to be very honest with you, I know you're a psychologist, but I get very mad. I get personally angry when I read in a magazine or a newspaper article or USA Today from a psychiatrist or someone who says that, well, divorce really doesn't matter. It really doesn't have any effect mm-hmm. on children. Uh, that is ridiculous. Divorce, to me, is one of the most devastating things a child can deal with. And when their mm-hmm. parents divorce, uh, you live with that the rest of your life. And, and I've been talking about this for over 30 years. I've had men come up to me 60 years old, 65 years old, 40 years old, 30 years old, and say to me, my parents divorced, and it still bothers me today. There is mm-hmm. no question that divorce is very devastating to a child. And Children go through so many things when their parents divorce. They don't know if it's their fault. Uh, So you start to get into these things like I did. Well, maybe if I get in trouble, and then my mom and dad will have to get together because I'm in trouble, and maybe that will uh, bring them together, and they'll try to get me out of the trouble. You go through all these things as an adolescent to bring your parents back, back together again because every child needs their mother and every child needs their father. And it's very, the, so the child is desperate to keep their parents together. And consequently, that leads to a lot of problems. And so mm-hmm. I really get mad when angry when somebody says, no, it really doesn't have an effect. Believe me, it absolutely, positively has a devastating effect. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Because this is a message that's not always politically correct. You know, people want to know that... Uh, I can do it. It's my life. I'll do what I want to do, and my kids will just adjust to that. And, you know, there's kids are resilient. They're going to come up with some ways to deal with it, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. And remember, I'm coming from an experience of 15 years or so doing child custody evaluations for the court. I have interviewed literally hundreds of kids. And when you got to this part in your talk in Salt Lake, you know, and you talked about how your parents' divorce had such a profound and immediate impact on you. Uh, we just can't overlook that. We Absolutely just not. can't I underestimate it. I think that Steven Spielberg it. understood that, and that's why I was so blessed that it was he who made that movie, because I think he tried to tell the movie as, as accurate as he could, but he also wanted the audience to understand why all of this occurred and he was very positive that what I ended up doing with my life, but he took you through the whole divorce thing, and it was very important to him. And he was a child of divorce. He ran away at 16. Tom Hanks' parents divorced. He ran away at 16. Leonardo DiCaprio's parents divorced, and he ran away as a teenager. So they, the three of them really had this bond to put that message across in the movie because they understood, like I, a divorced a son, a, a child from divorced parents, understood that it does have a meaningful effect, even years and years later, uh, on both on all of these men. And I thought they did a great job of trying to bring that out in the mm-hmm. film. Well, what a powerful message. And, and no apologies, folks. If you're listening to this and you are thinking about, you know, maybe uh, this is a good way to go for my family. Uh, I have a really good friend who wrote a book called Thinking Divorce, think again. And she's she's a divorce attorney, <laughs> which, wow. which is kind of ironic. But you know what she wanted to do is really illuminate to people the real effects and the real impact that this has in families. Now, having said this, I feel a need also to pull in another principle or another concept when I asked you who's responsible. I know you're not blaming your parents for your crimes. I'm I'm hearing you say this was a life-altering event for me, after which I began to make some choices that led me in this direction. Excellent. Absolutely. So, you know, there may be some some of you who are listening right now who are thinking, oh gosh, you know, I've already been through this divorce. Have I messed up my kids forever? What would no, you tell I think them? You, have to, you have to be there for your children. It's like I tell a lot of parents that say, my son got 
in trouble doing this, or my son took some drugs, or my son ended up doing this, or my daughter did this. Uh, they're just children. They're, they're young children, and they have to learn, and they'll, they're going to make mistakes. What you need to do is be there for them. They're your mo- you're their mother and their father. You need to be there and take them through that and be there for them. You don't give up on them. You don't just say, oh, they're just a troublemaker. They're never going to do anything with their life. You're their parents. You're all they have to count on. So it's even more for you to be involved in their life. And I I have raised three great sons. I've been blessed with a wonderful wife and raised three uh, wonderful sons. But I had to be involved in their life. And as much as I traveled, I was very involved with their life. I was on the phone with them every night, finding out what they were doing. I knew where they went. We have a curfew where I live, and they've had it for years, so they had to be in under that curfew, which I thought was a wonderful thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, I always was constantly talking to them about ethics and character. Uh, I remember one time driving through a, a Wendy's, and the, the, the young girl made a mistake. She thought I'd given her a 20. I'd only given her a 10, and she gave me a change for a 20, and I said through the window, I didn't really give you a 20. I just gave it. Oh, she said, thank you very much. And when I drove away, one of my sons said, well, Dad, you could have kept that extra money. And I remember uh-huh. that I pulled over and first asked him, do you think I, do I need the money? And second, what, what if that young girl lost her job? She checked up her register at the end of the day and they fired her because she was short $10. Was it worth me getting that $10? Would that have been the right thing to do? Mm-hmm. These are the kind of things you have to teach your children. You have to be there for them. You don't give up on them. They're all going to make mistakes. They're kids. And they're mm-hmm. all going to sometimes get, do something they shouldn't do. But that's why people, that's why children need their parents, and they need their parents together. And at least they need both their parents involved in their life. Mm, that's right. What's, um, oh boy, that just triggers all kinds of thoughts for me. You know, we sometimes sell our integrity for such a small price, and it's worth so much more than that. You can't really put a price on it. You can't. Has it been one of the questions I've had, and maybe some of our listeners are interested in this as well? Has it been a difficult thing for you to reconcile some of your past with what you're trying to accomplish or teach your kids? Now I know that your sons are grown now. Um, now talk I about that. I think my sons all have always judged me uh, on being their father. They knew of my past at a very young age, but they always just saw me as their father, and they only related to me as their father and how I treated them and uh, how I interacted with them, that's how they judged me. They didn't judge me by something I had done years before they were ever born. They looked at me as just, how is he as my father? How does he treat me as my father? I know he loves me. How does he care for me? Is he there for me? That That's how they judged me, not by mistakes I had made in mm-hmm. my life. And uh, And that's the way it should be. And I, you know, I knew that I had to I had to be a little more careful. And I think my sons were, I always tease them that I think that not one of them has ever gotten any trouble whatsoever. As you know, my oldest son Mm -hmm. is an FBI agent, which I couldn't be more proud. But Mm -hmm. he would have never been an FBI agent if he had gotten in any any trouble whatsoever. But I think my sons also realized as they got older that if they got in even a little bit of trouble, it was going to reflect on their father. And they had a great deal of respect for their father. And the last thing they wanted to do is have somebody say, well, what do you expect? That's the son of Frank Abagnale. So they went out of their way to make sure that they never did anything that would cause any embarrassment or shame to me. And, mm-hmm. and, and I, obviously, as their dad, appreciate that. But that was because they had a great deal of respect for me as their father. Mm-hmm. I've got a little bit of a follow-up thought on that. We'll, we'll come to that as soon as we get back from this next break. Okay. Raising kids is one of the most challenging and rewarding experiences we can have in life. Your children didn't come with an owner's manual, so it's up to you to learn whatever will assist you in your role as a mom or a dad. Join me and my husband, Dr. Paul, for a free weekly discussion about all of the hot topics in parenting. Listen to what others are saying about these calls. By applying the things I've learned to the parental power calls, I'm finally becoming the mom I always thought I would be. I really like to use parental power as kind of like a reference book. So as I have concerns with my parenting, I like to be able to look up on the blog and then listen to whatever podcast seems closely related. 
I like the variety of, of topics, the variety of age groups that are addressed. I'm on the parental power calls as often as I possibly can because I know I'm going to come away with something I can apply to being a parent that very day. Let us join your parenting team through parental power. Just send an email to Dr. Paul at liveonpurposeradio.com to register for the live calls. Or just check us out first through the link at drpaul.org. All of the previous calls are posted on our blog site, where you can also add your own input. Let's team up to start parenting on purpose. Thank you for joining me for the Live on Purpose radio podcast. It is truly an honor to be a part of your prosperity team. Please visit my website, drpaul.org, to get connected with other tools for you and your family. There you will find links to my weekly e-zine, Empower, Harnessing the Power of the Mind, and to the free parental power teleconference that I host every week with my wife, Vicki. You can also check out upcoming events or pick up powerful information products. Feel free to contact me directly with questions, comments, or to book me for your company or private event. Email me through drpaul at liveonpurposeradio.com. So while we're on this topic of parents and the important role that parents play, I have this strange belief, and this belief is that 100% of the people out there make mistakes. Is that anything close to what you would estimate, Frank? I would agree with that 100%. And that includes parents, right? Yes. So everybody's going to make mistakes. What what impresses me as being an important principle to remember You've made mistakes in your life. Everybody has. What are you going to do with those as it relates to your kids? And I asked you this question earlier because, you know, some people have probably wondered, well, how does Frank Abagnale teach his kids ethics and, and morals when he's got this stuff in his background? And to me, the fact that you've got this stuff in your background is not nearly as important as what you're choosing to do about the mistakes that you've made. And what if we can teach our kids that? I bet they're going to be making mistakes. What if we were to give them a model of, okay, yeah, you're going to make mistakes. Let's see what we can do to prevent as many of those as possible, you know, on the front end. But when they happen, okay, now what? And I think that's the important piece for a parent to remember. I've seen a number of cases where the parents are just so ashamed or so you know, they, they just want to hide it. They want to make it go away. When really for those kids, it's a powerful learning experience to see their parents handle and deal with some of the mistakes in their own life. Exactly. And, you know, um, when I spoke to those federal judges last week, um, I was introduced by the chief United States fed, uh, federal probation officer. And he said that in all of the U.S. probation offices around the country, there's a movie poster, and a lot of them I have signed. And on the poster, it says, I thank my government for where I am today. And I signed mm-hmm. a lot of those posters, and they're hung up in the probation office so that people that are in there that have, that have had problems in their life and have made mistakes understand that you can turn your life around. No matter what mm-hmm. you've done, whether you're an alcoholic, whether you've been into drugs, whether you've been... A child molester, you can turn your life around because we live in a great country where everybody gets a second chance. So I think that, mm-hmm. you know, if anything, I'd like to be be known in my life as somebody who's just a model of somebody who made a lot of mistakes in his life, but was the model of someone who was able to turn their life around, live the American dream, have a great family, and do something very positive with my life. I teach a program at the FBI Academy we call Enrichment Night. It's a a program in which is mandatory that all of the new agents attend. And that's Mm -hmm. basically a talk about my life and where I talk about ethics and the importance of family. So even the government Mm -hmm. the FBI realize the importance of these young agents knowing that their wife at home and their family at home and how important a part of their, that is of their life. And that, 
it's like you said, we're all going to make mistakes. It's what we do with those mistakes and how we turn that around and what we do, we can turn those mistakes into something very positive. And if people think about me, I'd like them to always, years from now, think about there is somebody who made a lot of mistakes but was able to turn their life around and do something very positive with it. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like the so what factor. You know, it, people have these stories about what's happened in their life. And, and quite frankly, this is the reason that I approached you in Salt Lake, because I see this story as one that that almost anyone can acknowledge. Wow, that's kind of an interesting story, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, to see what you've done with that is inspiring, because if Frank Abagnale can do that with, with what he had created in his life, what can I do with my package? What is it that I might be able to do if I were to really make those decisions, if I were to choose the right thing to do? And, it, you know, maybe first acknowledge there is a right thing and a wrong thing. Uh, but to make that choice and to start living intentionally in that direction. It's true. And I tell some inmates that are in prison that, you know, look, if I if they robbed a car or they made they did something, you know, they would use some drugs or sold some drugs. And I explained to them, look, if I did all the things I did and I was able to turn my life around, there is no reason that you can't come out of prison and turn your life around if you want to. But you have to want to. And I do believe that it is important that a lot of people need someone in their life to encourage them. A lot of people need someone that will believe in them and have faith in them, that sometimes they can't really do it on their own. They need somebody behind them that's pushing them, somebody that's there, whether it be their parents or their sister or their brother or a friend or someone who took a personal interest in them and just simply said, you know, you can do this, I'm there for you, and encouraging them along. Because sometimes feel, people feel they're very much alone in the world and really nobody cares what I do with my life, so I don't care. I mean, you have to care about your own life, and you have to want to change, but it is great to have someone there in your court who believes in you and has faith in you and gets behind you, and that's why it's very important for parents never to give up on their children. They can always, you can always help your children along and turn, them into some, turn a negative into a positive, but you have to be there for them. You know, I hope that one of the things that you listeners will take away from this discussion today is a new resolve to fiercely protect and enrich and build those key relationships in your life. Frank, you shared a definition of what a real man is. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners? You know, uh, one of the we talked about getting a lot of emails, and one of the emails I get from young people is they say, well, you were gifted, and I certainly was. I was one of those few children that got to grow up in the world with a daddy. The world is full of fathers, but there are very few men worthy of being called daddy by their child. I had a daddy who loved his children. He had three boys and a daughter. Every night at bedtime, he'd walk into your room. He'd drop down on his knee, kiss you on the cheek give you a hug, and he'd whisper deep into your, I love you, I love you very much. He never missed a night. I remember even when I grew older and fell asleep early, he always came into my room, and he was there. I woke up the next morning, knew he'd been by my bed. I remember years later, my older brother moved in my room. He was in the Marine Corps. He was six four, and my father would walk over to his bed, hug him, kiss him, told me he loved him. And uh, my father... Uh, really loved his children a great deal. And one day, of course, uh, a judge told me I had to choose one parent over the other, and I couldn't make that choice. And so I ran away, and I found myself on the street uh, with nowhere to go and no money. And so I started to do things that obviously I would live to have a lot of regrets about. But I was very fortunate that I was brought up in a great country where everybody gets a second chance. I mean, I went to some very bad places, and uh, what I did was nothing that was glamorous. I cried myself to sleep till I was 19 years old. I spent every birthday, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day in a hotel room somewhere in the world by myself where people didn't speak my language, and the only people that associated with me were people that believed me to be their peer. So I never got to go to a senior prom, a high school football game, or even share a relationship with someone my own age. And I always knew I'd get caught. Only a fool would believe that you can continually break mm -hmm. the law and not get caught. The law sometimes sleeps, but the law never dies. And I was caught, mm -hmm. and I went to some very bad places. And my boys have grown up asking their mother, why is it that Dad gets up in the middle of the night and goes down in the TV room, he doesn't turn the TV, and he just sits there all night? Because mm -hmm. there are things you can't forget. 
things you're not meant to forget. And while I was sitting in that French prison cell, which was pitch black, my father, 57, was climbing the subway in New York. He tripped, hit his head on a rail, and he was dead. I didn't know he was dead. Mm -hmm. But I was sitting in that cell thinking about him, how much I loved him, how much I missed him, how much I couldn't wait to see him, hold him, hug him, kiss him, tell him how sorry I was. But I never got the opportunity to do that. But I was very fortunate that I was brought up in a great country and I was given that second chance. I was able to turn my life around. And mm -hmm. I've been able to uh, contribute a great deal back. And I was very fortunate that about 35 years ago on an undercover assignment in Houston, Texas, I met my wife. And when my, my assignment was over, I told my wife who I was. Uh, I didn't have a dime to my name. I eventually asked her if she'd marry me against the wishes of her parents, she did. And that's why it would be easy for me to tell you that I saw the light, uh, that mm -hmm. prison rehabilitated me. I was a kid. I made some mistakes. I grew up. That's not true. I met my wife. She married me. She believed in me. She changed my life. She and she alone. She gave me three beautiful children. She gave me a family, and she turned my life around. Everything I have, everything I've done, is because of the love of a woman and the respect three boys have for their children. Mm -hmm. And I know that all parents who have children know that no matter how old they are, three months or 33 years old, when you lay your head on a pillow at night, no, where, no matter where that pillow is, and you're about mm -hmm. to close your eyes, the last thing you think about are your children. So mm -hmm. if you still have your mother or you still have your father, give them a hug, give them a kiss, and tell you to love them. And to those men that are listening, wealthy men, poor men, individuals, there is nothing more important than what being a man is really truly all about. It has nothing to do with money and achievements, skills, accomplishments, degrees, professions. A real man loves his wife. And a real man is faithful to his wife. And a real man next to God and his country put his wife and his children as the most important thing in his life. The truth is Steven Spielberg made a wonderful movie, but mm -hmm. I've done nothing greater, nothing more rewarding, nothing more worthwhile, nothing that's brought me more peace, more joy, more happiness, more calm in my life than simply being a good husband, a good father, and what I strive to be every day of my life, a great daddy. I mean, if you lived your life and did nothing but was a great husband and a great father and provided for your family, you've lived quite an amazing life. Mm. That is the true definition of success. And I think of wealth, too. Absolutely. And I appreciate what you've said about that. A real man loves and is faithful to his wife. A real man finds what it takes to become a daddy, not just a father. And the importance of that family and creating that rope for the kids, you know, they may stray, they may go off and make some mistakes. In fact, I'm pretty darn sure that everybody will. Absolutely. Uh, but creating that rope for them to come back to. It's been fascinating and inspiring uh, to talk with you today, Frank. I, I appreciated your being on this show and sharing some of your insights. Is there anything else that you would like to leave with our listeners as we close this out? Uh, just, just that I can't, I can't overemphasize to you the importance of family and the importance of being a good father and being a good husband and being a good daddy. Really, nothing else matters in life but being able to uh, instill in your own children the importance of being a good husband and a good father and being faithful to your wife and uh, knowing right from wrong, instilling that in your children. That's the most important thing you can do. And let's all be grateful that we live in a wonderful country where no matter what you do and no matter what mistakes you made in your life, you can come out, pay your debts to society, and turn your life around. It is never the end. No matter what mm -hmm. you've done, you can do something with your life. And that's the most important message I can miss. Never feel that, that it's the end. You can always, because we live in such a great country, do something very positive with your life. And it's mm -hmm. been an honor being on your show, and I thank you, Dr. Paul, for what you do, because unfortunately there are very few people putting that message out that people need to hear. Uh -oh. Thank you so much. Powerful message. I want to encourage all of you to go apply what you've learned and live on purpose. <laughs> 